Consider the job of the city planner. You might think of zoning maps and public hearings and building plans. There's always been much more to it than that, but today's planners are putting themselves on the front lines of society's most complex challenges, like building equity and fighting racism in their communities. That's the topic of this episode of Land Matters, the podcast of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. I'm your host, Anthony Flynn. Over the past year or so, following the outrage over the murder of George Floyd, there's been a reckoning about structural racism in American society, economic forces, institutions, and interactions that have discrimination baked in. That includes buying a home, for example, because of racial covenants and the practice of redlining, where banks wouldn't lend money to those in poor neighborhoods. That was nearly 100 years ago, but the impact was to deny the wealth that comes with home ownership over generations. There were other harmful policies that went into planning and building our cities, bulldozing of black neighborhoods during the time of urban renewal, or plowing freeways through those same neighborhoods, casting shadows and blighting everything nearby, setting zoning to favor the white and wealthy in single-family homes or designing poor quality public housing at isolated locations. Although city planners weren't directly or solely responsible for each of those decisions, the planning profession has been in some ways complicit in setting the stage for racial segregation. And that's why this summer, a group of planners from some of the largest U.S. cities has formed a coalition to confront racial inequity. These planners, nearly 20 so far, have acknowledged the mistakes of the past and committed to becoming change agents to move their profession towards the goal of racially equitable communities. Joining the conversation at Land Matters to talk about all this is one of the members of this coalition, Eleanor Sharp, Executive Director at the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. Also with us is Andrea Durbin, Director of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for the City of Portland, Oregon. Eleanor, let's start with you. There are at least two major parts to this, an acknowledgement of the past and a promise to act differently in the future. Let's talk about that first part, the history, because I think a lot of this is sort of hidden or not obvious to a lot of people. When you look back at Philadelphia, this could be in virtually any major city. What did you find looking back at the history of planning in the city of Philadelphia? Hi, Anthony. Thanks for having me. This is quite a pleasure. When I look back or take the long view of history and where Philadelphia is today, and similar to many major cities across the nation, the impact of racial covenants and redlining are still quite evident in our society today. We see a correlation in places that were redlined and local government decisions to declare areas blighted and in need of redevelopment. Those decisions in turn help to clear stable, if not poor, but stable communities of color so that more powerful institutional partners or wealthy residents could move in and develop and habitate. Redlining also today, if we look at previous maps of those areas, overlap with today's areas of concentrated poverty. And we don't think that's happenstance. We think there is a direct causal relationship there. Other policies and decisions from the past that are still living with us today include transportation policies that have negatively impacted many communities of color. In Philadelphia, our highways were put through neighborhoods populated by Black, Brown, and Asian residents. And when we put highways next to -to well-to-do communities or neighborhoods, we cap it, we sink it, we make them tunnels to avoid neighborhoods. Whereas in black and brown neighborhoods, they're just completely decimated. So those are a few examples from the past that are still relevant and still evident in Philadelphia today. And I could go on, but I'll turn it over to Andrea. Yes, thanks, Andrea. What did that history look like in Portland, Oregon? Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate the question. We released a report called The Racist History of Zoning and Planning in Portland a couple of years ago. And that report was really a cataloging for us of how past policies have shaped our city today, especially for the Black community. And we thought it was important to acknowledge and recognize these past harms as we look towards restitution and benefits for communities of color through planning. 
But Portland's history is similar to what we see in many cities across the country. Redlining, racially restrictive covenants written into real estate deeds, exclusionary policies and practices. In Portland, our first zoning code was adopted in 1924. And back then, single family zoning was applied to the 15 highest quality neighborhoods. So embedding exclusionary practices into our zoning policies from the very beginning. These policies harmed black and brown communities, denying them wealth generation and economic opportunities and access to good neighborhoods, access to amenities, much like what Eleanor has just described for Philadelphia. And I think for us, really the turning point in recognizing these past harms and the opportunity to really undo them came when we adopted our 2035 comprehensive plan in 2016. And that really marked a turning point for our approach to growth management. We really expanded our approach to focus more on who benefits and who experiences the burdens of growth and change. And really, thanks to input from community members, there was a really an, a very active, engaged community process. They really helped build a framework for us in the, our comprehensive plan, which starts with empowering community, supporting inclusive economic opportunities, supporting affordable housing and tenant protections, advancing environmental justice, leveraging private investment for public benefit, and analyzing the impacts, advancing equity and mitigating harm. So that really kind of set a framework for us and how we're doing the work going forward. But the Portland stories, Philadelphia stories, this is not unique. This is really how we've seen the impacts of past policies across our nation. And I think the planning directors that we're working with are coming together and saying is that we need to recognize that, we need to own that, acknowledge it, and make changes. So looking forward, let's pick up on that. What kinds of decisions and policies can be made going forward with racial equity more front and center? What might be a few examples? Eleanor, let's start with you. For everyone who is in this field and this profession, this is not necessarily easy work redressing decades of past practices that were taken for granted. We believe it requires intention. You have to specifically want to do this and set out to do this. And the intention is for us in Philadelphia is to be inclusive, to have folks who were previously disenfranchised, especially in the development process, be at the table, but not just show up at the table, but be at the table and trust that they are genuinely welcome as equal to the stakeholders or to the folks who have been at the table making decisions for years without them. How do we do that? How do we build that trust? How do we make a bigger table? This is not about excluding anyone. This is just creating a larger pie. And in Philadelphia, we had a comprehensive plan to similar to Portland that we launched about 10 years ago, Philadelphia 2035. And we are on the heels now because it's over a decade of revisiting and revamping that. We learned a lot of lessons in the last decade of how to set the table, of how to ensure that what we are representing is representative. Because the folly that and some of the lessons, the hard lessons we learned at the end of the day was as much and as hard as we tried, this is not something that singularly we could overcome to be inclusive. So prior to launching our new version of our comprehensive plan, as an agency, we've decided to take some time because we have a new saying that we need to move at the speed of trust, which is very different, very slow, very intentional, very carefully listening, hearing, learning, going back, coming forward, very iterative. It's no longer a blueprint of what we think and what we want. And we're just moving this along because we need to get this done by X date. It's more like it will take the time it will take. And so for our next comprehensive plan, we have already launched a steering committee before we start the planning part of it to have conversations with a vast array of stakeholders, everybody you can think of. And a large steering committee is hard to handle and hard to manage, but we're like, it's worth it because we need the voices at the table. We put a call out for volunteers from the general public because normally it's the same people who get chosen over and over to be at the table. We're like, hey, this is what we're doing. Who's interested? Send us a reason why you're interested and we will go through. We had seats. We're trying to keep it on steering committee at like 60 with various like 
known community representative and like 10 to 15 for the general public, we had over 800 people apply for 10 to 15 positions, which conveyed to us that there is a need for this. There's a demand, there's a desire to be a part of the conversation, but people have not been welcomed. They have not been sent an evite. They don't know how to do it. It is our job as planners in this realm at this point in time and in history to ensure that the evite goes to everyone. And if they so choose, they can participate for their own benefit, for their own future, to craft the society that they wish to be a part of. And we're very careful that we want to amplify the lived experience of people. And that this is not just solely professional planners who are making determinations, but decisions are being influenced by the lives of people and the lives that they live. We start in September with this reimagined committee for a new comprehensive plan. And it's going to look at how best to engage with various types of residents, various populations, disabled, non-English speaking, Hispanic, Black, African, you name it, we're going to see because how I communicate with my Asian population doesn't necessarily mean it's the same tools in which I communicate with my Hispanic population. But we want to hear from these groups on how best to engage. So our first launch of reimagining our comprehensive plan is figuring all these things out. So that's one thing that we're currently trying to do. But it's not easy work and it's time consuming. But I believe at the end of the day, it's worthwhile to make a society whole compared to the, like Andrew said, to fix it because we have done harm. And how do we sort of redress the harm that we have done through our policies and our procedures? So that's one aspect of what we're working on. Picking up on this idea of doing things differently, we've seen communities, different communities, banning single family only zoning, which just means that there's no section of the city that can be only generally more expensive single family homes that multifamily housing of some sort must be allowed, even if it's just a duplex or a three family. Andrea, tell us about that rationale and how that's playing out on the West Coast. Well, many cities, Portland included, we need more housing opportunities and access to more affordable housing. Uh, We have situations where people who've grown up in Portland can't afford to stay in Portland. So we recognize that there was a really an opening here that we needed to create more housing choices in single family zones. These are, you know, areas that are near transit and other key amenities, good schools. And, you know, it's really, um, we needed to kind of provide more choices for our residents. And so over a several years process, we worked with stakeholders, we worked with our city council. In last year, our city council adopted what we call the residential infill project. And that is new zoning that opens up single family residential areas for duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. And community organizations were very engaged in this process and they helped improve the proposal by building in additional incentives for affordable housing. This for us is a significant planning move to really look at how do we address community needs? How do we address the priorities? How do we implement our comp plan goals of providing more housing choices and affordable housing? And so we're really proud of this work. And the new zoning changes went into effect in August for August 1st. So we don't have a lot to share yet in terms of implementation, but we do believe that the change will be gradual over time, but it is part of our long-term plan to provide more housing opportunities for our residents and for people who are moving to Portland. So changing the public engagement process, changing zoning to promote more multifamily housing, different housing options. We might add dismantling urban freeways, which has become part of the Biden administration's urban agenda. There's a flip side to this, some would argue, and that's the danger of displacement and gentrification. So for example, you tear down an ugly elevated freeway, that's correcting a mistake from the past that caused hardship in poor neighborhoods. But then there's a rush to get in on what's suddenly prime real estate, right? So how do planners make sure there's fairness and equity in that process? I'm introducing a little bit of a curveball here, but Eleanor, let's hear your thoughts about that, and then we'll hear from Andrea. So this is the ultimate conundrum, especially in cities that have challenging areas of poverty and disenfranchisement, that the fear of any improvement will result 
in a complete new population moving in, displacing the existing population, some of whom have lived in these areas through all its challenges. And now that their sun is shining brightly, will not bear the rewards of any improvements. But on the flip side, it's also not legitimate to say that these areas shouldn't be improved, even if not for the people who live there, because it's not acceptable that we have areas of society that are doing well and areas that are not. It causes a lot of tension and the challenge is like, how do we infuse development into our cities that ensure that the rising tide lifts all boats? And I don't know if Andrew has figured this out to the T yet, but we're still challenged and still working on it. And we try different things and we throw things at the wall. One thing we decided to do 10 years ago when we did our update to our comprehensive plan was to try and codify public participation in the process. Because what we were thinking at the time was developers come in and landowners come in and they want to do what they want to do without serious consideration to the impact it will have on the existing residents, the existing fabric of the society, the existing community. And we created a system, a network of community organizations who could choose to register with the planning commission. And what that registration allowed them was participation in a new process, registered community organization, which required the developers to engage with these groups specifically to hold public meetings. So their neighbors and the general public would have some say into or about whatever the developer was proposing prior to any regulatory process that project needed to go to. So before getting a variance, before going through a civic design review, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I say that with caution because it's not without its downsides and its challenges because sometimes developers listen, sometimes they don't. Some developers are willing to accommodate the concerns of the community. Sometimes developers give offsets. They'll infuse funds into updating the neighborhood park. They will have community benefits agreement that allows access to whatever is built, a community room. There's a very sound list of what some developers do. And then there's some who are just simply not interested and go through the process of holding these meetings. But at the end of the day, nothing happens. So we're always trying, we're always thinking of new ideas of how to legitimately have a system that considers all facets, not just the profit, which we respect for the developers, but also for the land use, also for the impact on people who've lived there. We created also 10 years ago, our civic design review process that says that any project of a certain size will have some impact on the public realm. And this needs to be considered. And therefore they have to go through a process of review with the public in mind as well to have a look at it. Now, that doesn't necessarily answer questions of displacement and gentrification, but we're peeling away the onion until we can sort of get to the heart and the meat of it. So we're still working on it, we're still trying, it's not figured out, it's not determined, but it's always at the forefront of like our policies and procedures. And I'm sure, and part of our larger cohort of our planning directors of big cities, we're always having these kinds of discussions to see best practices from other cities, what Portland is doing, what DC is doing, what New York is doing, and how we can sort of make things better across the nation. In Portland, we have similar kind of processes, neighborhood context systems for development projects. Um, and I think that's a really critical part of how we start to address this because um, engaging community and making sure that local neighborhoods are involved and have an opportunity to engage in development projects is key. Gentrification and displacement are key concerns for us in Portland, as they are in many cities. And we have made a commitment of really trying to identify kind of what are some solutions and how do we co-create those solutions with community. So we've been working with community-based organizations to develop kind of new tools for the city. We're developing displacement risk analysis tools and mitigation tools to ensure that people are better off from the major public investments that we're making. This is all in, in development right now, but we are working with community to get input in terms of what are the solution sets that we need to be prioritizing and elevating and making sure that we have kind of clarity around when do we apply these tools for what kind of projects? What's that threshold that triggers this kind of deeper 
analysis and engagement with community. As Eleanor described, and this is kind of in continual work, we are doing that work now. Uh, we're working really closely with community at the pace of community. We really have prioritized this as a need because we want to kind of think more upstream and be more intentional and proactive about strategies and approaches that we can do to stabilize communities, stabilize businesses, and stabilize the cultural institutions that we want to retain in, in our neighborhoods. I'm also, Anthony, really glad that you mentioned urban freeways because I think the attention from the Biden administration on restitution for Black and brown communities that were harmed by building our urban freeway system across the country is really important and long overdue. And like many cities, Portland's experience, we placed a freeway right through the heart of a vibrant Black community. And it resulted in displacement of Black families, loss of wealth from home ownership and income from businesses, the evisceration of what was a really vibrant area that the Black community in Portland has never recovered from. And what's exciting is that we're starting to see a renewed conversation about that. In Portland, there's a Black community-driven process called the Albina Vision Trust, which is developing a long-term plan to really re-knit the Black community that was harmed by that freeway development and develop a you know, community plan that focuses on revitalizing this as a center for the Black community, creating a center of excellence for education creating connected spaces in urban places and providing affordable housing and economic opportunities. So it's a really exciting both process and vision that's emerging that is Black-led. And the city is a partner, our regional government is a partner. I mean, there are many partners in this, but it's Black-led and Black-defined. And I think for me, part of prioritizing racial equity and planning work really means taking the lead from community. And I think the Albina Vision Trust work that's happening in Portland is a great example of this leadership. Well, finally, I mentioned at the top how most people might think of planners as a bit more behind the scenes. But with this commitment, with this equity statement, you're being more prominent. And there are a lot of other decision makers, federal, state, local. What do you see for the role of city planners going forward? First, Andrea, and then Eleanor, you have the last word. Great question. Obviously, I think city planners play a critical role in ensuring that we're developing more equitable and just communities. We just need to flip the script. The question is, how do we use our tools, land use planning, zoning tools to advance racial equity, build community wealth, increase economic opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and communities of color? And we need to be intentional. Eleanor talked about this as well. We need to be intentional about who benefits, who's burdened, and ensure that community benefits and public good are centered in our planning processes and that we're planning for those who've been most underserved, black and brown communities. The work continues to be important. The tools continue to be important. It's about really taking a very different, recentering our approach of the kinds of questions and the kinds of outcomes we're seeking. Totally agree. And I won't repeat what you said because I had some of those thoughts as well. But I will add that planners do have a role in acknowledging the past. And a lot of planners are not trained in this, do not fully comprehend what has happened and how we've been complicit as a profession in this. And acknowledging that, which requires education, probably from our part in getting the word out. So thank you. Anthony, this helps to spread the word and make people more aware of planning's role in the larger context of our society. I think that's pretty critical. Acknowledge in the past before you can move forward. It's like a reconciliation, right? You've got to sort of say, we did this and we're sorry and we can then move on because planners help displace poor Black and brown people, allow large wealthy institutions to expand and treated explicitly people of color differently from the federal level to the state level to the local municipal levels. And it wasn't an afterthought, it was deliberate. And so we kind of got to acknowledge, not dwell there, but acknowledge and move on to that. And then in moving forward, we have a great opportunity and a great role to build trust that does not exist today or to build upon the trust that does exist and expand it geometrically and help communities plan for them instead of plan with them, as Andrea said earlier, co-create, right? So we're not coming in any longer. We're partners at the table as the city, as planners. We're not the deciders anymore. We want communities to sort of take lead on where they are and where they need to go and where they want to go with our support, with our expertise to get them there. We want to celebrate culture and history 
and recognize that that makes this whole world better for all of us, address environmental injustices, and diversify our profession. Like that's also part of our role as planners today. There's lots of exciting work ahead within this field. It's just a matter of recognizing where we're at in this moment of time, and it's critical to move forward. Eleanor Sharp and Andrea Durbin, thank you for this conversation at Land Matters. Eleanor Sharp is Executive Director at Philadelphia City Planning Commission. Andrea Durbin is Director of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for the City of Portland, Oregon. You can see the planner's statement at the City of Philadelphia's website at www.phila.gov. The Lincoln Institute has a long history of supporting planners and in planning, including bringing together planning directors from major cities each year to network and exchange ideas. As we celebrate our 75th anniversary this year, we started as the Lincoln Foundation in 1946. We're taking the opportunity to step back and look at all our programs and how they've developed, including the planning portfolio. And you can check it all out by going to lincolninst.edu and clicking on 75th anniversary on the homepage. Also follow us on Twitter. The handle is at Land Policy. And that is it for this episode of the Land Matters podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Flint. I hope you'll rate, review, subscribe, and recommend the show to anyone interested in cities and equity and all the issues we talked about on this show. Until next time, thanks for listening.